the dark into the light You have opened up our eyes I'd like to welcome you to our program, Truth For Today. I'm Pastor Steve Carr of Calvary Chapel in Arroyo Grande. Today we live in confusing times. However, God's Word can be a tremendous source of strength and guidance to those who believe. I'd like to invite you to join with us as we study through God's inspired Word. God has many truths He would like to communicate to you, but His greatest desire is that you might know Him and the love He has for you. He spoke through the prophet Jeremiah and said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. These words reveal how long he has loved you and how much he cares. If you will open your heart to him, I am confident that he will reveal himself to you and greatly encourage you today. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 5 this morning, looking at a subject that I think we can all relate to, the struggle of faith, the struggle in finding answers to our prayers. Now this particular story that we're going to study this morning is how Luke determines to open his story of the life of Christ. He begins here with these first few verses as a, a very simple introduction as to why and to who he is writing to. But now he begins the, this gospel account in earnest. He describes here for us the birth of John the Baptist and then the birth of Christ. And so he begins here with a, a godly couple, Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, and their struggle of faith. Read with me these first few verses, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was standing outside at the hour of incense. Now it's interesting here that Luke begins with the godly people that would bear this child. This couple, you can see very clearly from the outset, had a true relationship with the Lord. They prayed, they sought the Lord, they walked with Him to the point where the Scripture declares them as blameless before Him. Now it's important, I think, to note this because there's there is a word here, verse 7, that begins this, this particular verse, but. But they had no child. Now it's important, I think, that you note that this was a godly couple that was in love with the Lord, that had a true relationship with Him, because in those days and in our days, when there is sickness, 
or there is no children in a family. Many times people say, well, I think there's some hidden sin in those people or there's something wrong with them. But notice that it declares here and in verse 6, and they were both righteous. Both of them. Again, I think the scripture makes this clear because many times when uh, a couple goes childless, then someone says, well, it must be the woman. It must be her fault. But it makes very clear here that both of them had a right relationship with God. In Genesis 15, 6, it declares that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And so this couple believed in the Lord because the scripture declares them as righteous. They believed in him to the point where they walked in his commandments. There wasn't a bunch of talk, but they had a walk that was in harmony with their belief to the point that the scripture declares them blameless. Now, what does that mean? This is a term that is used many times in the New Testament, and it is essential that you understand what it means. Because it does not mean that they were perfect or that they were sinless. That is an impossibility for human beings. But it declares here that they were blameless. As the scripture declares you are to be blameless as believers. Read with me this passage in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. It says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless, harmless, the children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now notice the command, he says here, do not complain or dispute. He doesn't want us as murmurs, complainers, uh, being aggressive, angry individuals who are disputing with other people all the time. If so, we are not blameless. But if we choose to love and to trust the Lord and to commit those things that are problems and seek reconciliation with those that we have problems with, then we are true lights in this world because we are different from this world. Thus, we become blameless. The word blameless literally means one who is not deserving of censure or condemnation being condemned for something specific that they are doing. It means that they were, they were not walking contrary to the law of God in any respect. It doesn't mean that they were sinless. It doesn't mean that they were perfect. But they were obeying the Lord's commands as best they knew how. Now, if I see that this is the meaning of what blameless means, and what it, that it, this is the result of really walking with the Lord, believing in Him, walking in His commandments, then I need to be very, uh, I need to recognize personally that this is what the Lord wants me to do. He wants me to be a light in this world. And in comparing this passage in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, it's very clear that this is what it means to be blameless before him. Now, it's important that when you see this, this couple and you see what and acknowledge what people say when there is sickness in a person's life that's a believer or they go childless, that there's some kind of hidden sin or some kind of hidden problem, this is why it's taking place. I have heard people say this many, many times. Especially when I go to someone's hospital bed and I'm praying for them and they tell me what someone else has, that has just left their hospital bed has told them. That they have some hidden sin that they need to confess and that's why they're there. Such an encouraging thought. <laughs> and so 
I just encourage people, look, you know, this is not the instruction of Scripture. In John chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, it says there, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now here's the question. Here's the, the thought of that day. And it is still the thought of our day. Who has sinned? This guy, this child has been born blind. So who's at fault here? What's the problem? Did his parents have a problem? Or did he have a problem? And Jesus said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Neither. He said, But that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now when it appears that the Lord is not working, what Jesus is declaring here is that he has another work that he is about to perform. You see, Jesus said, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. What did Jesus just do? Right after he said this, he healed the man. But why did he wait all of this man's life to heal him? I can't answer that question. But all I know is that the Lord has a very specific and special time that he fulfills all of his works. We know this because the scripture makes it very clear that God has eternal purposes and an eternal plan that he is working out. When I don't understand his plan, and as I'll say probably several of you here today, you're probably questioning, I don't get, Lord, why aren't you answering this prayer? Why aren't you doing that? Why haven't you taken care of this? There is a specific reason. There is an eternal plan. Just as in this man who would, had been born blind, God was working it out and there was an appointed time to answer that prayer. In my next point, we will look at some of those passages because it is essential. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that God's eternal purposes will be fulfilled. And, sh and you have to believe that they will, even though you don't understand it. In Romans 11.33, it says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So God's ways, God's timing, God's reasoning is beyond your ability to figure it out. Jesus didn't answer fully why this man had waited all this time, what he was doing. All he declared was, look, I'm going to work a work. I'm going to do something. All of this has taken place so that I can work. So when the Lord doesn't answer your prayer, or he seemingly has missed the boat. I guarantee you, he has not missed the boat. He has another plan that he is working out. And it's an eternal plan that you've got to trust and believe him to do. In Ephesians 3, verse 11, referring to the cross, Paul said, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. An eternal purpose, very important that you acknowledge that even the suffering and agony of Christ himself had an eternal purpose. God was working out, and that eternal purpose was to save you and me. And yet, when people look at that from the outside, when the disciples looked at Christ and what took place in his life, they said, we don't get this. We don't understand this. But there was an eternal purpose that God was accomplishing. And he is seeking to accomplish his eternal purposes in you as well. But the questions always come up. Samuel's parents, they had that que the questions. Abraham and Sarah, they had those questions. And so Zacharias and Elizabeth had these very same questions. Now notice what takes place in verse 11. The angel of the Lord appears to him. 
standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer, singular, is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. But he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now this godly couple, a man, Zacharias, who is a priest, who was fulfilling his service to the Lord, while he was there in Jerusalem. Now you have to get this picture because it's, it's a really a powerful one. The priests had 24 divisions among them and there were thousands of priests. These 24 divisions, Zacharias was a part of one. He was in the eighth division of the priesthood. These priests served two weeks out of the year one week in the first six months of the year, one week in the second six months. And they served that entire week. They determined how and what they would do in their service to the Lord by drawing lots, and it is described here in our text. It was his lot, it fell to him, which was a tremendous privilege, to go inside of the temple itself, which was divided into two sections, the holiest of all where the Ark of the Covenant sat and the very presence of God dwelt. Outside of that was a larger room called the, ho the Holy Place. And inside this Holy Place was the altar of incense. Incense throughout the scripture is used as a picture of the prayers of the saints. This altar of incense sat right before the entrance into the presence of God. And so when they went and they offered this incense there, this was a symbol of the prayers of the saints and is referred as such in the book of Revelation. The prayers of the saints ascending up before God. And at that moment when he is offering this incense, on that day, here the angel Gabriel comes to him and says, your prayer is heard. Not your prayers, but the one prayer that you have been praying for a long time. That prayer is now heard at an appointed time. Now it's interesting that this is, I believe, a key to understanding prayer. Many times you pray, you petition the Lord, you ask of Him, and certain things the Lord answers immediately because they are in reference to you or, or something personal for your life. But as soon as you start praying for someone else or other circumstances are involved in those issues you're praying about, now you have the will of another person. Now you have other circumstances and other people's lives involved in that prayer. And sometimes those prayers are not going to be answered according to your will, because God is a sovereign God. If he is not sovereign over answering prayers and he, he is not sovereign over what he wants to do, then he is not God. If I can change his sovereign will by my prayer and I say, I want it today, and you're going to do what I want you to do. Now, I'm sovereign, I'm God, and he is not. Do you see the difference there? Very important. You have to understand that God has a sovereign plan and he's going to fulfill that plan. You have to surrender and yield to that plan because my plan is sometimes not the best plan. Now, these two people were praying for a child. 
And it, this was an issue that they cared about greatly. And they wanted an answer to it. By the angel declaring to him, your prayer is answered. You see, Zacharias was still praying. Even at this late stage in his life. His wife was old. He was old. And yet, from his response, we'll see in just a minute, his unbelief came out. Most likely, he was praying about this, but he was just going through the motions. He really didn't believe anymore. Very much like when they prayed for Peter when he was taken and put into prison in Acts chapter 12. And it says that the church prayed night and day for Peter's release. But when he stood at the door and he said, it's Peter. I mean, they, they didn't believe that it was Peter. I mean, it's like this contradiction. We're praying for your release, but now you're standing at the door, but we don't really believe it's you. Are you sure it's Peter? And so the question is, is are you praying for things and have you just, are you just going through the motions? Are you praying, but you've really given up hope that it will ever really be answered? I, I hope not. Because you, you have to pray with the understanding that God has a sovereign plan. And your plan might not be his plan. You have to, or his timing may not be your timing. It says in Genesis eighteen fourteen, referring to Abraham and Sarah and their desire for a child, God said to them, is anything too hard for the Lord? Yet he says, at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. At the appointed time. How come he didn't do it 25 years earlier? I don't know. I can't tell you. God is working a work. And he's fulfilling his plan. And that plan was to establish faith in Abraham. To do a work in Sarah. To do a work inside of their lives. And a whole bunch of other things that we probably have no understanding of that the Lord was accomplishing in their lives. But note, at the appointed time, God has a timing that you cannot change or make uh, different. In 2 Kings 4.17, when Elisha promised another woman that she would have a child after being barren for many years, she said, he said there, the scripture declares, the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come. Very important. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3, referring to the vision, the prophetic vision of Christ's coming. It says the vision is yet for an appointed time. Why did he come at the time that he did? Why didn't he come hundreds, thousands of years before? Why did he come at that particular time? Because that's the eternal purpose and plan of God being established. He fulfilled that prophecy to the day, to the hour, to the minute that God had ordained. And so I encourage you, if you, if you think that the Lord is going to instantly answer every prayer, you don't need faith. If he did answer every prayer instantly, you wouldn't need any faith at all. You wouldn't need any patience. You wouldn't need any wisdom over God's eternal plan that is being accomplished in your life. Now notice here in this text also what John is told by the angel Gabriel. What does he tell him John, this child is going to be like that we know to be John the Baptist? Notice he says in verse 14, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Now this is a given. I mean, you can't uh, see a little baby in somebody's arms and, and not see the joy in their face. That's, this is just a given. But notice he says, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Now this is an important statement because it doesn't say here great in the sight of men. It says here, great in the sight of the Lord. 
You see, what men think, how men view things, is much different than how the Lord views things. What is right in his sight is really the most important issue of life. And so this particular man was to be great in the sight of the Lord. In the sight of men, he was looked at as a kook, as some crazy guy that, you know, was just a little off. And yet, what was he to do? Verse 16, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Not, that is what wise men and women do. It says in the scriptures in... Uh, Where does it say that in the scriptures? In Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. It says, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is why he was great in the sight of the Lord. Because he was a man who turned multitudes of people to, to Christ. Now, if you want to be great in the sight of the Lord, you need to do the same. You need to turn many to righteousness. This is what I meant earlier in our announcement time about being evangelicals. If we are evangelicals, then we need to be evangelical. We need to share our faith with others. And if you do, you will be great in the sight of the Lord, you will be, as the scripture declares here, you will shine like the brightness of the firmament, like the stars forever and ever. I'll tell you, it's an eternal reward, an eternal work that you do. Please share your faith, learn how to share your faith, and then communicate to others that are hurting and lost and dying in this dark world. Be a light in this world. In Luke chapter 16, verse 15, it declares there that there are that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So what men esteem as being great, God considers an abomination. What God considers right, men in this world consider an abomination. You see, there is a real contrast there, and it's very clear. Those are the words of Christ himself. So what do you esteem as being really important in life? Is it what the world considers important or what God considers important? Very, very essential issue. In Acts chapter 8, verse 21, when Peter ministered to Simon the sorcerer, he said to him, your heart is not right in the sight of God. Because that's the only place it's important as to whether my heart is right. It's in his sight. And so always be cognizant of that issue. What is right? Am I right? in the sight of the Lord. And then notice another issue of what would make this man great. It says, he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. Now, I say this to those of you who are drinkers here, because this is an issue that I believe is, is very difficult. And I want to share with you just a little personal, personal encouragement in your life, from my life. As a young Christian, I thought to myself, I can still drink. I can still drink my wine. I can still drink my beer. And I can do okay. I can get away with it. And I did great for quite a while. Until one day, I decided, well, I'm not going to have dinner tonight. I'm just going to have a beer. And then I'll have another one. And another one. And pretty soon, that what, what took place is obviously you know what took place. 
I made a total raving fool of myself in front of a bunch of people that I was trying to share the Lord with. And I stumbled all of those individuals. And I remember that was the last time that I tipped the glass to my lips. That was the last day. Because I remember I got up that next morning and I, I felt like a total fool. And I was. And I acted like one. All I can say to you is this is what the scripture says. Proverbs 20 verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler or will cause you to brawl. And whoever is led astray or deceived thereby is not wise. Now that's not my words. That's the words of Scripture. If you are a drinker, you are not wise. Because one day you will get caught, just like I did. You may go for a long period of time and not. But one day you will, and you'll feel pretty bad. Here's another passage, Proverbs 23, verse 29 through 33. It says there, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has the redness of eyes? Now that's a whole lot of questions, is it not? Who has woe, sorrow, contentions, complaints, wounds, redness of eyes? It says those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in and search for mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things, and your heart will utter perverse things. And I have experienced that, and many of you have as well. I've seen strange things and uttered perverse things in that state. And so I encourage you, if you don't want sorrow, if you don't want contentions, you don't want conflicts, just don't drink. You would be amazed at how many marital conflicts I counsel that have alcohol in the middle of them and as the cause of them. I'll tell you, it's amazing. So I would encourage you, be wise. Be wise. And yet, this is one of the things that the Scripture declares made this man great. The next thing that it declares, it says that he will be filled with the Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now later in our next study, when Mary, pregnant with the Christ child, comes in and visits Elizabeth, who is also pregnant with John the Baptist, it says that John in her womb leapt when Mary with the Christ child came into her presence. And it says that she was filled with the Holy Spirit at that very moment. Now, this, I believe, is so important for every individual, being filled with the Spirit from birth, from the beginning. Pray for your kids. Pray for them right now. I don't care how old they are. Pray for them that they might be filled with the Holy Spirit. And pray for yourself that you would be filled with the Spirit because that is what enables you to be great in God's kingdom and to do great things for His kingdom. You need, as Paul said in Ephesians 1.19, the greatness of His power to those who believe. If you want to do great things, you need the greatness of His power. It can't happen without it. This is what made John a great man. And then it says last, verse 17, he will go before Him. Now who is the Him referring to? The Christ. He will go before Him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now when Zacharias heard this particular verse of scripture quoted, which comes from Malachi chapter 4, a prophecy that is very clear that Elijah will come before the great and notable day of the Lord, and this is what he will do. 
Now, he is declaring here that John is not Elijah, but that he is coming with the same character and power and anointing as Elijah. And yet, because Elijah is still yet to come. In the book of Revelation, there he appears coming to precede the Lord's return as one of those two witnesses. He is going to come and he's going to precede the Lord's return at his second coming and he is going to proclaim the gospel in a very powerful way. We know that because prophecy declares it to be. But notice here it says that he will come in the same spirit and power as Elijah. When John was asked, was he Elijah? He said, no, I am not. Because he knew he had come in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now most uh, Hebrew scholars say that this word to is really a, not a good translation of the Hebrew word. It should be translated here with. Turn the fathers with the children to the Lord. And so if you, if you go back in Malachi and you, you put this word with in there, it brings tremendous sense to this prophecy. In other words, the Lord is saying he's going to turn an entire family to the Lord. And he's going to bring families to faith in Christ. And so, and also if you note the latter part of it, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make them ready to receive and to meet the Lord. And so this was the man that God was choosing to use. Now how did he respond? Verse 18. And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my well wife is well advanced in years. Now this was a wise man. He didn't notice, he didn't say, And my wife is an old woman. <laughs> He says, I am an old man, and she is well advanced in years. <laughs> and the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings, or literally, this good news. But, behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled, when? In their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. And so it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. And boy, what a writing experience he had with his wife that day, telling her what took place. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach from among men. Now notice how Zacharias responds. He responds by wanting evidence, proof, show me how is this going to happen. Give me some kind of evidence or sign that this is really going to come to pass. As if the word of the angel that came directly from the Lord was not enough. Now this is where unbelief comes in. Many times when you pray for something for a long period of time, Many times you just, you continue to go through the motions, but you really don't believe it's going to happen. Now, we have to give this guy a little grace, okay? Because every one of us has been at that place, have we not? And so, give Zacharias a little grace. This guy has been praying for almost his whole married life. And here, the Lord says, now your prayer is answered. Okay? But... I'm an old guy. My wife is well advanced in years. How is this going to happen? Show me a sign. Which was a common thing in those days to ask for a sign. But in this case, 
it was a sign of unbelief. Now, the Lord did give him a sign. He gave him a sign of being mute. And that sign was to prove that God was meant what he said, which really was an act of tremendous grace upon this man. Grace. He could have said to him, you know what? No child for you. You don't believe? We're done. Finished. He didn't. He said, you still are going to receive the child, but you are going to be corrected because of it. Notice it says there at the end of verse 20, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. So this is one of the consequences of unbelief. We're going to look at this in just a minute. The consequences of unbelief is that God still does his sovereign plan. He works it out, but many times you just don't get to participate. He graciously allows him to participate, but he corrects him by giving him this sign of being mute. It was a gracious thing, a loving thing, that he corrected him thus. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, that whom the Lord loves, he corrects. And so he loved this man enough to correct him and to bring this correction upon his life. But his, his problem was he was looking at himself, his age, his ability. And isn't that where we stumble? Sometimes it's the length of time that we pray, but sometimes we just look at our own ability and we say, Lord, I, I've never been able to do this. How do you think I'm going to be able to do it now? And we just look at our, ourselves and we just say, or look, I look at my bank account. I, I can't take care of this need. Uh, how is it going to happen? We look at our own resources and we stagger, we waver at the promise of God. It says in Romans chapter 4, verse 20, that this is exactly what Abraham did not do. Now, we know he did it at the beginning. And one of the processes that he was taking Abraham through in that 25-year waiting period before his child came was he was strengthening his faith. He was, this was one of the things that was taking place. Because it says at this point when he received the child, it says that he, became, he did not waver at the promise of God, but became strengthened in his faith. So from this point... To this point, he was strengthened in his faith to ultimately not waver at the promise of God. God was doing the same thing in Sarah's life. Remember, she laughed, and the Lord heard it and said, Why did you laugh? And she said, Oh, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh, really. <laughs> I, you, you misheard that, Lord. No, he heard it correctly. He was dealing with her as well to get her to this place. So the, my point is this, is that when the Lord gives you a promise, that should be enough. If he commands you to do something, that should be enough. So I encourage you today, if the Lord has promised you something, believe him. If you say, but Steve, I've, I've got unbelief. Well, do what it declares in Mark 9.24. There was a man who brought to Jesus his son that needed healing, and it hadn't happened. It hadn't occurred. He said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Now, did the Lord answer that prayer? He did. So this is a valid prayer. Jesus did not turn this man away. Use the faith you have, even if it is the grain of a mustard seed, even if it's the smallest amount of faith you can imagine, just say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Take me the rest of the way. Strengthen me in faith and get me to the end because that's what he wants to do. Now, one, one point I'd like to make before we leave this because when people ask for signs, Gideon did this. He asked for a sign by laying out a fleece. And many times you'll hear Christians say, 
well, I don't know what the Lord wants, so I'm going to lay out a fleece before the Lord. And they follow Gideon's example. Well, Gideon laying out a fleece before the Lord was a sign of his unbelief. Just as Zacharias was asking for a sign in his unbelief. So laying out a fleece before the Lord is not a sign of faith. Gideon had already been commanded and told what he was to do. He was promised by God that he would take care of him. And Gideon said, no, Lord, I'll lay this fleece out on the, on the ground. And in the morning, I want the fleece to be saturated with dew. And I want the ground to be dry. Well, the next morning, that's exactly what took place. And Gideon went, now, Lord, don't get angry at me. I, what I want you to do this time is I want you to make the, the fleece dry and I want the ground to have dew all over it. Well, the Lord did it graciously. Graciously. Now, Zacharias knew much more than Gideon. He was to whom much is given, much more is required. Zacharias was a priest. He knew the Word of God. He knew God's promise. Do you see the difference in the way the Lord deals with people? There is a definite reason for this difference. And so where the Lord gives you a promise, believe the promise. Believe it. If He commands you, that's enough. And it should be enough. Just do what He tells you to do and you know what? The Lord will give you the grace to go through it all the way to the end. If he promises, is there anything that is bigger than God that will impede that promise from coming to pass? Not at all. You know, today I showed you some pictures of our new church building. I remember when the Lord spoke to my heart, he used a passage of scripture where Haggai, was ministering to the people, telling them to build their building. And it says, he said, do it. There's a little verse of scripture there that says, do it. And I remember the day the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, Steve, do it. Trust me. Yet we looked at the figures. We look at the major issue of what it's going to take to do all of this. And I'll tell you, there was some unbelief there in my heart. But the verse of Scripture said, do it. We took it to the elders and we prayed about it and the Lord confirmed to every one of those guys, do it. We took it to you as a congregation. Not one of you said, don't do it. Every one of you walked out of here when I asked you that day, tell me now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Where, or do you want to do this? And you walked out and you said, do it. And we have a building that's almost complete today. And you know what? The Lord is going to take care of us. I remember when the Lord told us as an elder board to hire our first youth pastor. Well, we didn't have all the money to pay this guy. And the Lord said, do it. Hire him. Step out in faith. And you know what? That guy never missed a paycheck. The Lord provided. So what the Lord tells you to do do it because he will take care of you and he will get you to the end you're looking for. Now last here, I want you to just remember one thing, well, several things about unbelief. Unbelief has incredible consequences. What are those consequences? The correction that comes sometimes, as in Zacharias' life, is sure to come. You will be corrected because God wants you to trust him and he's going to do whatever it takes to get you to trust him. Sometimes people say to me, well, why am I going through the same problem again? Have you ever said that? Why, why is this happening to me all over again? Because you didn't trust him the first time. He wants you to trust him this time. And he's trying to strengthen your faith. And he's taking you through those same things again. If you will not believe him, you won't see his works. The works that God wants to accomplish with you. 
in Matthew 13, 58. It says concerning the hometown of Jesus himself, Nazareth. What, how did they treat Na uh, Jesus in Nazareth? They took him, it says in the scripture, out to the hill and they wanted to throw him over the cliff. That's the way, that's how receptive the people in Nazareth were to Jesus. And the scripture says he did not do many mighty works or miracles there because of their what? Their unbelief. So a person's unbelief will not allow them to see the works that God wants that to do in their midst. Sec er, thirdly, unbelief will cause you not to experience what God wants to give you personally in your life. You see, this was the issue with Zacharias. You see, God did the work, but he was mute. He couldn't even, he couldn't even, I mean, the joy of sharing that with his wife, he had to write on a piece of paper instead of share verbally. And so there are things that God wants to do in your life that you will not experience. When you do not trust the Lord, you won't experience his rest or his power in your life. It says of the children of Israel in Hebrews 3.19, so we see they could not enter into his rest because of unbelief. If you don't experience his rest, you're missing. You're missing the best that God has to give you. If you miss his power, which comes by faith and faith alone, you are missing his best. And then last, you will not, if you will not believe, you will not, God, you, uh, you won't do what God calls you to do, what he commands you to do. You won't see that ministry gift come forth from your life. In Matthew 17, 20, when the disciples could not cast the demon out of a child, that parent brought that child to Jesus and said, here, your disciples couldn't do anything. He cast the demon out, and then the disciples came to him and said, why couldn't we cast the demon out of this child? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. You will not experience what God wants you to experience personally. You won't see those works that he wants to do in your life. You will not be used in the way God wants to use you unless there is faith in your life. There are major consequences of unbelief. Don't let those consequences come to pass in your life. Trust him and see those works. Trust Him and experience personally that rest, that power that He wants to give you. Trust Him and let Him use you the way He intends to use you. But that requires faith. Let's go to Him and ask Him for that faith. Thank you for joining us. I want to encourage you to apply what you've heard today and mix God's Word with faith. Believe His promises. Obey his commands. Take the action God requires, and God will begin to work in your life. If you have never made a commitment to Christ, I want to encourage you to make that decision today by asking God to forgive you. Invite Christ into your heart. Turn from any known sin and begin to walk with him daily. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you would like someone to pray with you, please call our office at the number on your screen and someone will be there to help. Or in a moment, you will see a simple prayer on your screen that you can pray. Just pray that prayer from your heart sincerely and God will hear you. However you make your commitment, do it today. God bless you and join us again next week for Truth For Today.
Jesus Christ.